Ah, danke, danke, danke schön. Ähm, guten Abend. Ähm, ich fühle mich geehrt, ein Teil dieser Konferenz und der damit verbundenen Ausstellung zu sein. Und ich möchte mich ganz herzlich bei Anselm Franke und Dieter Friedrichsen und dem Haus der Kulturen der Welt für die Einladung bedanken. Ähm, außerdem möchte ich mich entschuldigen. Mein Deutsch ist gerade mal gut genug, um zu wissen, dass es besser ist, wenn ich heute Abend Englisch spreche. So. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Okay, great. If I go, I, when I get excited, I speak very quickly. So if I start going really fast, maybe people in the back can just make a gesture to do this. Slow <laughs> down. And I, I can definitely do that. Thank you all, especially for being here on a night when there is a citywide music festival. I, uh, you know, California is a wonderful place to live, but I can't imagine drawing 300 intellectuals to a single room to think about history in this way um, in my hometown. Uh, so I'm very, very excited to be here. Thank you. Um, so, our talk tonight is going to have three parts. In the first part, I want to talk a little bit about the arc of the project that I've been involved with for a number of years, tracing the roots of our American ideals of what computers should be back to the counterculture of the 1960s. I want to then take a very particular piece of that history, the idea of virtual community, which grows in the United States alongside the internet and the World Wide Web, and I want to unpack that. To give you a preview, I want to argue that the dream of disembodied community facilitated by computers is an echo of an earlier dream, a dream of disembodied communities of consciousness to be lived out on communes as an alternative to the political state and as an alternative to politics in general. Where we're going tonight is to a place where technology, community, and consciousness replace politics, at least in theory. And that, in turn, is going to set up the third part of our talk. In the third part of our talk, I want to reflect on how the countercultural movement into the computing world set the stage for a larger turn toward what was called in the 90s the new economy and what we call now neoliberalism. Uh, when I started my book, I started researching my book, I thought the counterculture really was counter to mainstream American economic culture. I no longer think that, and I hope that by the end of this evening, you won't either. So, let me give you a little background. Um, you know, some of you have asked how I came to, to, to work on this. Um, back in the 1990s, I was a recovering journalist, and I went um, to California for graduate school. I had written a book about the Vietnam War, and in that book, computers were the emblems of the Cold War military state. They were everything wrong with the United States. So imagine my surprise when I moved to California and suddenly there's Wired Magazine depicting computers as tools for countercultural revolution. Now, I'm not supposed to move away from the microphone, so I'm only going to move, I'm going to dash out and come back. Okay, but I have to show you something. Have a look up there. Cypherpunks plot world liberation. But where are they fighting for liberation? They're fighting for liberation at the Treasury Department. Huh? Inside the state? And check out that picture. Um, so, um, okay, uh, we have to talk about drugs here a little bit. Um, I don't know which drug generation you're from. Um, I'm from the acid generation. And when I see that, that big circular globe with the smiley face, I see a nice round tab. Okay? And the smiley face is itself a very sort of 60s, 70s emblem. Um, people from a different drug generation have told me that that looks like ecstasy. I believe them. I don't know. Um, the daisy, the flower, is itself a key 60s emblem. You may remember from the 1967 March on the Pentagon, a beautiful blonde-haired man sliding a daisy into the rifle of a soldier, an iconic image of the 60s. What I want to say is that when I saw this cover in 1997, I was looking at the iconography of the 1960s and of the whole Earth world. But now it was attached to the device that I always thought the counterculture stood against, the computer. The computer is apparently responsible for the long boom. 
So I began to wonder, how did this happen? How did this come about? Well, I started doing my scholarly diligence, and you know, people argue that utopian visions of technology always happen when new technologies come into being. That's true, but it doesn't answer the question how this one came to be. Another answer, which I found more persuasive over the years, was that a new social class was emerging, a virtual class that moved, very highly mobile, um, built around intellectual labor. And that I also came to believe. But the key question for me was, by what mechanics did this happen? How did this happen? So I started looking through Wired Magazine, and I used to be a, a journalist, I did some investigative work, and so I started behaving like a journalist again. I started mapping out who talked to who and who knew who. Inside the pages of Wired Magazine, there turned out to be a group of people who had been together for nearly 30 years. They were people who worked at Wired Magazine now, but earlier had worked at something called the Whole Earth Review, the Well, the Whole Earth Electronic Link, one of the first and still most influential online communities, and a consulting firm called the Global Business Network. What held these groups together was their founding by a man named Stuart Brand. Stuart Brand, in turn, had founded the Coevolution Quarterly, where many of these folks had been employed, and before that, most famously, the Whole Earth Catalog. Now, thanks very much to the House Decorator de Velt, I have a copy of the very first Whole Earth Catalog with me tonight. I'm going to pass it into the audience. Please pass it around, and please make sure it comes back here at the end. <laughs> thanks. All right. Great. So I'm going to make two arguments tonight. One of my arguments is going to be about simply countercultural ideals and how they enter the computing world and the new economy. The other argument is going to be about the mechanics of that process. To understand how a weird hippie catalog could have changed American culture the way that this one did, you need to also understand a little bit about the mechanics of influence. This is a world in which journalists gather and become entrepreneurs. They don't just report on the communities they're studying, they gather the communities together. Media, like the whole Earth catalog, become forums for the new social networks that are gathered. And inside these forums, people talk to each other in ways that generate new terms. Terms like virtual community, personal computer, electronic frontier. The whole Earth Network is the group of people who brought us those three terms. And they brought, it, they brought them to us through a process that I will be outlining tonight. How's the speed so far? Good? All right, great. Okay, great. All right. So, um, let's go back to the past. Um, does anybody know what these people are wearing around their necks? Punch cards, absolutely. Also called Hollerith cards. This is the free speech movement marching in Berkeley in 1964. What set off the free speech movement was, in fact, an attempt to computerize the student registration system at the university. These are students who are protesting, and on the card you see that it says strike. And there was a saying, do not fold, spindle, or mutilate, which is what was written on the card. For the students of the, <laughs> for the, students of the free speech movement, being turned into information, digital information, was terrifying. And this just makes to me no sense. And it sparked a question for me, which is, what was the counterculture? I thought the counterculture hated computers. How did they come to love computers? What was going on here? So one of the things that I had to figure out, and it really surprised me, was that in America in the 1960s, there was not one counterculture. There were, in fact, two countercultures, each quite different than the other. One was characterized by political ideas, the new left. I know the New Left is very active here in Germany as well. In the New Left, think groups like Students for a Democratic Society, the goal was to stage political struggle, to have leaders and parties, to have kind of hierarchical, relatively bureaucratic organizations, to have manifestos and constitutions, and to have a group like Students for a Democratic Society. There was another counterculture, though, another wing of the counterculture that rejected that. Let me tell you a small story. Um, some of you may know Ken Kesey, um, formerly of the Merry Pranksters. Um, 
famous acid head of his generation, James Prankster. In 1966, he was invited to speak to an anti-war rally in Berkeley. He had several thousand young people getting ready to march on a military base. He got up in front of them and he said, don't march. That's what they do. He took out his harmonica and he played a song, Home, Home on the Range. And he said, go home. Build a better world at home. That's the new communalist ethos in a nutshell. Politics for the new communalists was bankrupt. Politics was what they did. What we needed to do, thought Stuart Brand and the new communalists he led, was to form communities built around a shared mindset, a shared consciousness. Now, how are we going to get there? Well, fortunately, we had small-scale technologies that could help us do that. You know, um, Brand, the new communalists, the new left, everyone was against bureaucracy. Everyone was against big technology and mass culture. But they were pretty excited about small-scale culture, uh, small-scale technology, things like stereos, automobiles, drugs, again. Those were things that could be personally transformative and lived in the life space. And they took those tools with them to communes. 1966 to 1973 was the largest wave of communal activity in all of American history. Reputable sources estimate that as many as seven to 10 million Americans were living on communes in this period. And many of them were heading back to the land. This is a picture of a commune from called Drop City. Uh, in Colorado, Trinidad, Colorado. And you'll notice that there's a Buckminster Fuller style dome here. Um, each one of those colored panels used to be the top of an automobile. They were chopped off the automobiles from a junkyard by hand with axes and then <laughs> DIY in the extreme. <laughs> And then they were cut to exactly the size that Buckminster Fuller's direction suggested and tacked together. Now you have to wonder, why was it so important for people to go back to Colorado and to go to junkyards and chop the tops off cars by hand so as to build that kind of a house? And I want to tell you, that kind of a house, when it rains, not so comfortable. It kind of leaks. The answer is, and I think a really, is a really good and illuminating understanding of what new communalists' ideals about technology were. New communalists followed an idea that Buckminster Fuller had put forth. They said, what we have to do is take the large-scale technologies from our hyper-militarized, hyper-corporate culture and repurpose them. Take them into our own life domain. Work with them there. And use them to build homes for the new consciousness-based kind of society that we hope to establish. Now, it may sound like kind of a joke, but you'll notice that that house is not square. And anyone here who was alive during the 1960s will remember that square wasn't just a geometric shape, it was a state of mind. But to share the proper consciousness for revolution in this model was to precisely not be square. And housing like this was there to help you experience the organic unity of the world, an experience made available to you thanks to repurposed industrial technologies. Okay, let's talk now a little bit about the whole earth catalog. May I borrow the catalog for just a moment? I'll give it right back, I promise. <laughs> Thanks, it's coming, coming right back, coming right back. Um, so this is the whole earth catalog as it looked in 1968 in the fall when it was created. By the time it stopped publishing in 1972, it was 400 pages long. It had won the National Book Award. It had sold a million and a half copies and was arguably the most visible and influential publication in the American counterculture. And in West Berlin. Oh, also in West Berlin. Huh, great. Um, I didn't, 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 didn't know that. Um, I want to say a little bit about where it came from. So Stuart Brand, the founder, along with his wife Lois Brand, was a reasonably small-time military veteran and multimedia art producer in the early 1960s. His father died, left him a small amount of money, and he was wondering what to do with it, how to affect social change. He was living in San Francisco, or near San Francisco, he was actually living at the edge of Stanford in this period, and 
he saw that a number of his friends from San Francisco were heading back to the land. He and his wife, Lois, put together a list of tools they thought people might need back on the land, and brought that list, handwritten, out into the hinterland, saw what people needed, then came back to Menlo Park in California, near Stanford, and created the catalog. Now, what's so interesting to me about the tools piece of the catalog is that these are not the kinds of tools you would think that you would need if you were heading to start a farm in the country. Okay. Now, if you were going back to the land, what would you take with you? Shout it out. Books. <laughs> <laughs> hippies, man. Hippies are a problem. Okay, come on, come on, work with me here. What would you take? Horse. Well, a horse. Excellent. Horse. What else? Horse. What? Guns? Tents. Tents. Thank you. I was a little worried about you over there. Okay, so, so tents. What else? Shovels. Absolutely. Trap. Tra tra huh? Uh, yeah, an axe. Absolutely. Me? I would take a tractor and an electric saw. Okay. Almost none of those things are actually available in the catalog. It's really interesting. There were 133 items in the original catalog, and they included a disproportionate number of books. 80%, I did a count, okay? 80% of the items in the original catalog were books. And this was incredibly revealing to me, because these are tools not for the transformation of the landscape, not for the transformation of government, but for the transformation of consciousness, of mindset. And what the catalog had were tools for the transformation of consciousness. And you, know, you can see two kinds of transforma transformatory tools here. One that I think is really fascinating is on the left. That's Hewlett Packard's top of the line calculator from this period. Inside Hewlett Packard in this period, this calculator was called the personal computer, meaning the individual adding machine. Down below, you see a book by Norbert Wiener. Norbert Wiener was a military researcher in the 1940s, creator of cybernetics. If I head back to the land, I don't want a calculator. And I certainly don't want a book written by a military theorist in the 40s. <laughs> But Brand does want these things there. Why? Because information theory from the 40s is the grounding for consciousness theory of the 1960s. The information systems of the 40s made it possible for the children of the 60s to imagine a world linked by invisible forces. And that world I think you can see very effectively in the exhibition. The other thing that I think is important is this other kind of tool. You can see um, that's actually Stuart Brand's body there in his deerskin jacket, trying to pose as a Native American. <laughs> you see some macrame and knitting body crafts, crafts designed to help you reconfigure your identity. These kinds of tools are what we had in the catalog. Tools for mind, tools for body change. The other interesting thing about the catalog is that it didn't actually sell anything. You couldn't buy anything in the catalog. The catalog was what Brand called a pointing device. Each item would contain um, a listing of the item, a description, and then a description of where you could buy it elsewhere. Each item was also mailed in by a reader after the first edition. Brand did the first one, but then after that he solicited readers. So readers wrote in, recommended products, and told people where to get them. Does that sound like the internet to you? Sure did to me. And it turns out that Alan Kay, one of the designers of the early MacBook that many of you probably own, was in fact very influenced in his design of early interfaces by the whole Earth catalog. All right, one more story. 1972, Xerox Park is built in Palo Alto, California. This is the central research place at which Alan Kay worked, and it's the place where Steve Jobs of Apple famously visited and either learned from or stole uh, depending on your point of view. Um, Xerox is technology for the interface that you, you use now on your Mac, the graphical user interface. That interface was designed by Alan Kay in a building whose library consisted only of books that had been featured in the Whole Earth Catalog. In 1972, the Xerox Park Library was nothing but books from the Whole Earth Catalog. For the first two years of Xerox, that's what was there. 
So these worlds are very tightly entwined. So people write in, they, they give information. This has a powerful effect. One of the effects that it has in the 1960s is that it makes the counterculture visible to itself. <laughs> Think about 1968. No internet, no cell phone, slow mail, regular landline <coughs> telephones. You start a little commune in your town. How do you know who is doing a commune in Colorado, New Mexico, Canada? You don't, unless you write and find friends. The catalog becomes a map of the commune world in this period. It becomes a forum for countercultural networks to meet each other in print first, and then ultimately in conferences like the one on the right, which is something called the Alloy Conference. And a, a, you know, a group of scientists, technologists, hippies, and education people who got together and came up with new ways of thinking about how society ought to be organized. <coughs> the one other thing I want to show you about the catalog that's really important are the categories that the tools are organized into. You'll notice that nothing there says politics. Nothing says government, nothing says state. Rather, our job is to understand whole systems, to recognize our part in them, to act like a learning nomad, living in community, organized by communication, performing acts of industry and craft within a whole system. The whole system framework is one that enters the counterculture not from hippie rebellion, but from cybernetics and from World War II, directly from the military-industrial <coughs> Systems theory is the language of military-industrial research in this period. And I just want to flag that the whole Earth catalog was originally conceived of by Stuart Brand and discussed as a research enterprise. He thought this would be a tool for researching new ways to live. All right. So I want to turn now to the very specific history of the idea of virtual community. On communes, you wanted to build a community of consciousness, a community of a shared mindset. You were there with your body, of course, but the social organization was supposed to be built around a shared mind. You were supposed to be able to do away with bureaucracy, do away with formal leadership, do away with manifestos and constitutions, simply share a mind. That understanding of what community could be and should be died on the communes in 1972 or three. Most communes only lasted a year or two. It turns out that without pretty authoritarian leadership, communes don't work very well. I don't want to go into why that's so, but no. But the idea of the virtual community, the idea of the geographically distributed community represented in information technology that the whole Earth catalog has traveled very far indeed. So, a little bit of history. In the early 1980s, Stuart Brand was a depressed man. He had this funny little conference in San Francisco with Ken Kesey uh, and one other person. They got up on stage, it's 1983, and they said, what happened to the counterculture? You know, we had Reagan, we had this new world, no one seemed to remember hippies. They thought they were going to change the world and now they felt forgotten. About four months later, Somebody went to Stuart Brand and said, hey, there are these hackers. And somebody wrote a book about them called uh, Hackers. And there are these three generations of them. And Brand said, oh, well, OK. We'll have a conference. We'll bring them together. The next thing you know, Brand is famous now as a spokesman for the computing world. And suddenly, as counterculturalists and hackers, former counterculturalists and new technology hackers come together, they begin to imagine computing as the solution to the problem of the failure of the counterculture. Yeah, maybe we fail to build communities of consciousness on communes, but maybe we don't even have to go back to communes anymore. We don't need to get dirty and dig stuff up. We have computers. We can do it from our desktops. And remember also that computers in this period have no pictures, right? They're text only. So that in some sense leaves your body behind in a very interesting way. All right, the story I want to tell now is a story about Howard Rheingold. Some of you may know. He's the first person to use the term virtual community in print, 1987. He was a member of The Well and an editor at The Whole Earth for a while. The Well was founded in 1985 by Stuart Brand. It's the Whole Earth Electronic Link. And in many ways, as I'll say in a moment, it was designed to take the Whole Earth Catalog understanding of the world and Whole Earth Catalog communities and make them available to the digital age. Rheingold was a member of that community. He wrote a very famous book. And after that book came out, the meme of virtual community traveled everywhere, to research world, journalism, 
e-marketing, like, yes, e-marketing. Uh, okay, so I have one bad joke coming. Um, you know the car company Saab? Yeah? Okay, so Saab, quite seriously, started an online community there for a bit. Guess what they wanted to call it? Saab Stories. <laughs> I wish I was kidding. Okay. All right, so let's talk about The Well. The Well was founded in 1985. Larry Brilliant, a friend of Stuart Brands, had developed a computer software system and he needed to populate it. He needed to do something with it. And he went to Stuart, he knew the catalog, he went to Stuart and said, hey, the whole earth catalog used to be really important. How about we do an online whole earth catalog? And Brand said, no, 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 no. What we need to do really is build an online real-time conversation <coughs> space. And so they set up the system using the categories from the whole earth catalog <coughs> in such a way as to create a catalog in which people could not just write in, but could write in to each other in real time. The ethos of the well was the ethos of the catalog. It was deeply technophilic. It was reversionary, meaning that the hope was you could use technology to go back to the past and make things better. It was communal rather than bureaucratic. It was alternative, seen as something separate from mainstream America, though actually it wasn't so separate. And it was supposed to be deeply empowering to individual members. All of these ideals migrated into the idea of virtual community. Let me say a little bit about how the well worked. So the catalog, um, in many ways, was a very sort of um, simple system. It, you, people wrote in, it was published twice a year. It was very time limited. The well was very different. It was a layered system of conferences, a nested system of conferences. There were managers. It was actually owned um, by Stuart Brand and some other folks. Um, they never made much money at all. It was much, much cheaper than the other systems that were online at the time. And it consisted basically of threaded conversations. So no pictures, just writing in, dialing in by modem. <laughs> dialing in. Thank you. Plants. Um, so dial in, and once you were in, you could choose a conference on a topic of your interest and talk to other people in that conference space. And the host of that conference, who monitored the conference and made sure that no one said anything too crazy, was not paid, but got free time. Okay? And then individual users could start new conferences when they wanted to, or new threads as well. So as a technical simple system, it was very simple. As a social system, it was very interesting. It included a lot of people who had been part of the whole Earth world and were now working in Northern California in the technology industries, which had blossomed. It also included a lot of Grateful Dead heads, um, people who were rabid fans of the Grateful Dead and could talk about the dead for hours and hours. And here's the, here's the genius of it. It also included journalists. Stuart Brand gave free accounts to journalists. Brilliant move, because journalists need things to write about. And they wrote about the world that they were in. And suddenly, the whole Earth electronic link became a model for a new kind of community entirely through their work. To understand why, we need to understand one other thing. The other thing is a very deep shift in industrial conditions in Silicon Valley at this point. Silicon Valley is, is where I live. It's the area starting just south of San Francisco, extending to San Jose. It um, includes towns like Mountain View, Palo Alto, Menlo Park. I live in Mountain View, about a mile from Google. Um, Facebook is right on the edge of my campus. Um, we are, Yahoo is, Yahoo is three miles from my house. I mean, these companies are everywhere. That was not what Silicon Valley used to look like. Um, oh, I'm in the wrong slide, sorry. Um, we've talked about that, let me skip ahead one. In the 1960s, Silicon Valley was an aerospace place. We had Lockheed, we made airplanes. These companies, aerospace companies, were organized in a very traditional manner in hierarchies. They were manufacturing companies. And employment was very secure. You had a job, you got a job with Lockheed, you theoretically had a job for life. By the mid-1980s, when the well was formed, there had been an industrial transformation. The aerospace industry had come way down, and the tech, the digital tech industry had come way up. And, you know, ironically, the digital tech industry was built right on the bones of the military aeronautics industry. Um, the, every chip, as far as I know, every chip until about 1972 that was produced, every silicon chip, was actually put into a Polaris intercontinental missile. 
Um, but there started to be some extra chips and some computers. By 1985, computers have been shrunken to be microcomputers, and production in the valley has ceased to be organized around large corporations. Now it was organized around small networks of producers. Um, one person whose dissertation I read from this period quoted a, a person in 1984 saying, I don't work for my company, I work for the valley. Average job turnover in 1985 among engineers was 100% every two years. Think about that. So if everybody turns over every two years, that means that some people are turning over much faster than that. Startup culture, which still exists very much in Silicon Valley, is a frenetic culture. People need jobs, they have to hustle. How do you get a job? How do you have contract employment? How do you move contract to contract? To do that, you need a very strong social network outside the office. If you only know people at your office, you're dead. And so, in a project-based economy, a social network like the whole Earth Electronic Link becomes extraordinarily important. Howard Rheingold acknowledged this. He said, on the well, talk is work. He says, the well is an outright magical resource professionally. But now listen to this. This is where the counterculture piece comes back. It's a gift economy, he says, where people do things for one another out of a spirit of building something between them, rather than a spreadsheet calculating quid pro quo. To folks in California, the meaning of this is super clear immediately. Spreadsheet calculated quid pro quo is what hierarchies, bureaucracies, corporate America does. Spiritual activity, gift economies, that's what we do in the counterculture. That's what we do in our better utopia that we might have failed to build in the 60s, but that we might just build now. I'll give you another feel of this. Here's John Cope. John Cope was one of the managers of the well. He worked there um, for a number of years, came to the well from a commune called The Farm. And he said, on the well, professional and personal interactions overlap. But listen to how he explains why that's so. He says, because that's what a village is. It's a place where you go down to the butcher or the blacksmith and transact your business. And at night, meet those same neighbors down at the local tavern or the Friday night dance. He's writing this, ladies and gentlemen, in 1992 in Silicon Valley the most high-tech region in the entire United States. And he's talking about blacksmiths? <laughs> Butchers? <coughs> the Friday night dance? I don't know if you've ever seen engineers dance in large groups. <laughs> if you come to Silicon Valley, I invite you to the Thursday night dance at St. Stephen's Pub. Um, and anyone who's been to Mountain View will know what that is, and anyone who hasn't has a treat in store for them. My point here is that John Coates' rhetoric comes straight from the counterculture. This is the language of the commune <coughs> ideal. This is the language that says we're hoping to go back to the land, to a time before industrial reality, and we're hoping to use these small-scale technologies to do it. We're going to transform our consciousness and think of ourselves as living in a village. But thinking of yourself living in a village is not a way to escape industrial economics. On the contrary, I argue, at some length in the book, but I'll argue it here, it's the beginning of a neoliberal model. In this village, you can start to do two things at the same time. You can build your identity, and you can trade on your identity. Two key features of neoliberal economics. In a virtual community, you have what sociologists often call not hierarchy, but its opposite, heterarchy. In a heterarchy, people trade different kinds of values. So I might tell you jokes, and you think, oh, he's really funny. But I'm telling you jokes, and in the back of my mind I know, oh, but you're an engineer at Yahoo. And maybe I'm Howard Reinwald, and I'm a reporter, and I write for magazines. And I go online to my virtual community, where I have friends who think I'm funny, and I write, and I say, hey, does anybody know what Yahoo's new product release is going to be? And you say, oh, I'll tell Howard, because he's really funny. Okay, that's how Howard Reingold's life, in some sense, used to work. And this is how many of our lives work today. Uh, how many of you, I don't know the German situation or the German statistics, how many of you are on Facebook? Okay, I'll, uh, I love the shame. <laughs> that was really good. That was really great. The slowness with which the hands went up. Oh, Berlin, ex-Berlin. That was really good. Thank you. 
Uh, oh, I love it. I love this city. <laughs> yeah, see, see, in California, we're shameless now. We're, we're shameless utopians. It's sort of, sort of awful. I, I want to say that the countercultural ideal of a community built on shared consciousness, a community where life and work could come together and be experienced together, is now, by the 1990s, available as a metaphor of virtual community, in which life and work, identity and information seeking also come together. You can be friends with people, you can get jobs from people, if you do your coding well on the well, you might get a coding job at a company. The social, the personal, the professional have merged. And the political is nowhere in sight. So, to sum the virtual community piece, Virtual community entered public debate through the work of journalists like Howard Rheingold, promoters like John Perry Barlow, and also from core members like John Code and Cliff Vigallo. Also entered through professional journalists like John Markoff of the New York Times and his former wife, Katie Hafner, and through the well itself. The well became a prototype of a new way of being for its members, and it was extraordinarily influential and still is. Virtual community emerged on the well as part of a contact language between different communities, technologists, Grateful Deadheads, former commune people, working together in an online network forum with habits and beliefs and ideologies shaped by the Whole Earth Catalog <coughs> decades earlier. It embodied a long-standing Whole Earth ethos, but used that ethos under very different technological and economic conditions. And it ended up facilitating the kind of independent network information labor that we all do now. The legacy of, of, of this period is, is very powerful. Um, I think you can see a lot of the legacy in, in the show here, in the exhibition here, um, which is a wonderful thing. I want to talk about it in the way that it haunts our economy and our social computing world. I think many Americans still hope that we can create a technology-enabled world built around shared consciousness, focus on the self, self-representation, self-improvement. I think many Americans still hope that we can abandon politics, we can leave it behind, and we can escape its corruptions, its difficulties, its conflicts, and move instead to a world in which you're cool, I'm cool, it's cool. <laughs> And I think that's what people are looking for when they join and celebrate peer forms of production and networked elites. They look for networks where you can have the kind of community that seems impossible in, in a bureaucracy. You know, I think in many ways the new communalist dreams of communities of consciousness provided a guiding ethos for networked computing. And the irony is that that ethos helped underwrite the emergence of a highly individualized kind of economy that's very rough to live in. Contract labor is a very hard way to live, and it's a way that increasing numbers of Americans are living. Blending your community and your labor sounds fun until you've worked on a farm. When you get up in the middle of the night to milk a cow, boy, I bet you wish for, for, for the 40-hour week and some separation between home and work. And I think that's true for a lot of the people I know in code. Um, I want to conclude by expressing some ambivalence. There's something deeply beautiful in the longing for community that animated the counterculture of 1968. It's something I still respond to. I feel it acutely when I walk into the exhibition space and I see the videos, when I see the pages of the whole Earth catalog, when I see the psychedelic designs. The dream of a world that shares its consciousness, of a world that can be whole, is an extraordinarily powerful dream. It's a dream that comes to us in part from World War II and the era immediately after, and it's a dream that receives its amplification in the 1960s. But it's a dream that leaves us with a very dangerous legacy. You know, as I think Ansel and Diedrich have, have really shown in the show, when everything is part of the whole, it gets very difficult talk about difference. When everything is regulated by consciousness and cool, it gets very difficult to negotiate the distribution of resources. 
You know, it turns out that communes were enormously conservative places socially, by and large. Tremendously straight, tremendously white. Not intentionally, necessarily, but because when you take away contracts, governance, law, when you move to a community of consciousness, what you are left with is Max Weber's greatest nightmare. You are left with charisma. And charisma is a terrible way to govern. You want, you want to have equal rights with me? Man, that's just so not cool. <laughs> when you shift from legislated distribution of resource discussions to these kinds of communities are cool, when you hope that Google search engine will be your politics, um, you've lost something. One of the things you've lost most acutely, and you can see this in the United States now, is you've lost the ability to reach across to people different from yourself. I would argue that the vision of community that we've lost here is a vision of communities that don't separate themselves from one another, but rather embrace difference. My vision of a benevolent whole is one in which each member can reach across and connect with someone very different than themselves, racially, economically, politically. That's a vision we need in America, and that's a vision that there's just only the tiniest hint of in the whole earth world. Thank you very much for being here tonight.